Romans chapter 12. I begin reading at the uh, first verse, and what we're going to be speaking about tonight is the results of a broken will. The results of a broken will. There's been quite a number of people who have asked a little more questions on this, so I'll see if I can give some answers to this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministering, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teaches, on teaching. Or he that exhorteth, on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth, with diligence. He that showeth mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be without the stimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints, and given the hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. We are the same mind one toward another. None not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Dear Heavenly Father, open our understanding tonight, illuminate us and enlighten us. We may be able to help to answer the questions that some people have concerning the broken will. Thank you, Lord, for the illumination tonight and for your presence and the precious, wonderful Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. In that wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, I want you to note first that he said you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice, a living. You're actually a living sacrifice to God all the time. Holy and acceptable to God. Now, if God cannot accept anything that's not acceptable, then if God requires to be acceptable in verse 1, then he's requiring us to be acceptable in verse 2. Because it says that you may know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If God actually has, as some people say, given us the three choices of the will of God, we could say, well, we could say it would be uh, uh, good, uh, better, 
uh, or and best. Now, if this is the case, if this would be the case, as some people think it is, uh, then God does not require you to give all your will to him because you have a reservation on your will. There has to be something wrong with that. God has never suggested that we limit his will. He only has one will, and that will is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, if you try to live in life, to try to just get by with whatever you can get by with, you can actually have a life that runs in gooder or better, good, better or best, uh, because you're not surrendering to the will of God. Now, God has no desire for anybody to say, I'm not going to surrender all my will to God. So the teaching that God would allow you to have your own will doesn't make scriptural sense. Our will must of necessity be broken. Before our will can be broken, we have to understand what the will of the God is. Now, we can find that out. <clears throat> Only by going to the Word of God, not going to your preacher to find out. He may not know. But God does know. And <clears throat> now, if that will is not broken, your will coming up against God's will, and I'm going to do it like this this time. All right? Now we have will and we have will. All right, this is God's will and this is your will. <clears throat> so now we are actually having a, a problem because God's will and my will, if it doesn't coincide, we got a problem. God's will never budges. Our will is flexible, but God's will is not flexible. What God says he will do, he will do, and he will continue to do as long as we remain in his will. But if we don't remain in his will, then we begin to get into an inferior part of life. <clears throat> now, I want to show you something. We're going to be talking about some things here tonight. <clears throat> Let's suppose that, <clears throat> that I'm just going to go quickly through this. Your will and God's will may be exactly the same. Because what God lays upon your heart may be his will for your life. So he's beginning to show you what his will is for your life. <clears throat> Let's suppose... That, that you have a, some desire within you to be a missionary in a certain, certain country. I'm just making up a story now. God had placed that will of his into your heart, and now you have a will to go to that country. Everything sounds good now, doesn't it? Because... Your will and God's will is the same. But if this will is not broken, then that will that is God's will can be perverted and come crashing against God's will and give you a tremendous lot of problems. Now let me show you how this works. Let's suppose it is God's will for you to go to... Uh, to China as a missionary. Let's suppose it's his will. All right, that is God's will. It is your will to go to China because you feel led of the Spirit to go to China. So now, it looks very much like your will and God's will coincides, but it doesn't. Because you're getting ready to go to China, and God is saying no. But you're going to go anyway because you know that you're supposed to go because, it's, because you feel in your spirit you need to go and you crash against God's will. 
You come home homesick. Everything's messed up. What's wrong? Your will has never been broken. What happened? The Lord's saying, it is my will for you to go to China, but you're not ready to go to China. You're not ready for China. Your life is not in line with my word yet. You're not mature enough as a Christian. You're not strong enough as a Christian yet. But your will now crashes against God's will. It is no longer coincide. It is now a crash. A lot of times our will and God's will is actually the same to a certain extent because the reason you have a desire is because God has ultimately placed that desire in your heart. Now I'm going to try to explain some of these things to you as we go along. How do I know then that my will is broken? Your will can only be broken when you do what Jesus said do, and when he said, Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken, but whosoever the stone shall fall upon it will grind him into powder. Now, that statement in Matthew 21, 44, that I kind of just quoted here, uh, I want you to notice that he said, you fall upon a stone, you'll be broken. You will be broken. In other words, if you don't get to the place in life where you actually see that you've come against everything, you can't make it, and you fall upon that stone and you say, Lord, I'm finished. Everything I've tried to do has been nothing but a mess. I'm not, I'm not getting where I ought to get. I'm, I'm discouraged. I'm perplexed. Something's wrong. It may be that you're not so far out of God's will. It's mainly that your will hasn't been broken yet. And therefore, you're, you're kind of lingering behind or trying to go ahead of God. When that will is broken and you fall upon that rock, that means you are broken. That means that's it for your will. Your will is gone now. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 20 and verse 17, the same thing it says, whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. That's verse uh, 18 there. But whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him into powder. That means you're either going to be broken by God and crushed, or you're going to voluntarily crush yourself. That's how simple it is. This is not a child play. It's, it's just the way it is. You're either going to break or you're going to be judged and crushed. One of the two. Many people have tried to go through life. They have tried hard to please God. But what they're doing, they're basing their theory on <coughs> uh, my will up against God's will. We, we are not often aware of the fact that when, when our will is not broken, we try to push God to submit to us rather than we submit to him. Now watch what happens when your will is not broken. Moses is facing the Lord, and the Lord says, Moses, you go and you lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses said, when I'm slow of speech, I'm slow of tongue, I can't do it, I'm not eloquent. What was wrong with Moses? His will wasn't broken. After God had spoken to Moses, and after God had made sure Moses understood that he's the one that made his mouth, Moses still had a problem. So God said, all right, if you want an inferior lifestyle, I'm putting this in my own interpretation, then I'll have Aaron to be your spokesman instead of you being a spokesman. If you'd left it up to me, I could have given you the words to speak, but since you don't think that I'm capable of doing that, then Aaron will trot alongside of you. And Moses now has Aaron to be his spokesman.
And I suppose it was a hindrance to him all his life. The second thing that happened here is that God had to crush Moses. Moses is crushed. Moses became the meekest man on the face of the earth because God crushed him. The man couldn't crush himself. So God let him get in all kind of trouble and have all kind of problems because he would not crush himself. He wouldn't break his heart. He wouldn't break down before the Lord and say, Lord, thy will be done as Jesus did in the garden. I remember that Jesus, when he was in the garden, he, he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, if it isn't, thy will be done. I'm going to drink that cup. So after the, uh, the, the soldiers come to get him, and I believe it was Peter began to uh, challenge them, and Jesus said, don't you think I ought to drink that cup? Well, I'm going to drink that cup. See, this is God's will. And Moses' life would have been a whole lot better if he had fell upon the rock and said, Lord, I'm helpless. I can't speak. I am, you have to take over. I'm willing to be used, Lord, but I cannot do it on my own. If there's going to have to be a miracle if I'm going to perform what you want done. You see, the Lord is nigh unto them that are a broken heart and save as such as be as a contrite spirit. That's Psalms 34 and 18. And Psalms 51, 17 says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart of God that will not despise. You remember when we read here in, in the 12th chapter of Romans that you give yourself a living sacrifice? What do you say? The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. You cannot handle your life. I don't care how good you are, you can't handle your life. And if you don't surrender to God the whole way, eventually you're going to have yourself a terrible problem. <clears throat> now, I want to look at several things here. The biblical operation of grace in your life is number one. Biblical Christian operation of grace. Multitudes of people, God has great plans for their spiritual life. In fact, the matter is, God is so desirous that people walk in his fullness, being filled with the fullness of his spirit and the fullness of God. Uh, that he has said in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, Wherefore given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Now think about that. This is God wanting to give you his divine nature. But he's not going to give it to you if your will is going to crash against his. So God may desire, and you say, I'm so hungry for God. Oh, if I just could come to God. But wait a little. You come and you think that, well, I'm going to get in God's will. But bang, you hit you're not in God's will. Your will has never been broken. And as hungry as you may be for God, you have to return to the rock. And I'm going to call that Calvary for right now. And you're going to go to that rock and you're going to break. Lord, I'm, I'm surrendering all. It's one thing to sing, I surrender all. It's another thing to surrender all. You can get in a church with a thousand people and saying, I surrender all. But when you come up to the very fact, your will is, <clears throat> now listen carefully, your will is to become a quality, godly, holy Christian. That's your will. God's will is that you become a godly, holy, and righteous Christian as well. So now your will is the same as God's will. But as you go to do that, you suddenly crash in against God's will because you are trying to decide 
how you're going to serve God. You're going to decide whether to bring these traditions along with you. You're going to decide whether your theory you have been taught goes along with you. And you're trying, because you have not been broken, you're trying to mingle uh, your righteousness, your holiness, and your uh, spiritual greatness with God. It may be pride involved in it. Boy, I'm one of the best Christians in the world. See, that until that will is broken, even if you're endeavoring to do all you can, that will is going to give you problems. That will is a problem maker. It's going to be that way all your life until that will is totally, completely broken till you can do everything God says do and do it without argument because a broken will will not argue back. No argumentative in there, it's in it. Now, <clears throat> let's look at number two. All right, now, uh, God wants you to be a part of a church it's his will that you fellowship with the saints. He said in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 and 25, let us consider one another to provoke into love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of is, some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now I want you to notice here, it's God's will for you to be a part of a church. But because of your unbroken will because of your traditional ideas because of your opinion and your interpretation of the word then you begin to select a church that's going to agree with your theology and God wants you to find a church that agrees with him but you are going to find a church that agrees with your theology and because your will is not broken Therefore, your theology is not broken, your traditions is not broken, and therefore the Word of God becomes of none effect, <clears throat> and you latch up with these people and wonder why things are not happening the way you thought they was going to. It's because <clears throat> you crashed against the will of God. Your will and God's will is not coinciding. Your will is one thing, God's will is another. And although you may say, well, these are precious people and they agree with me and I love them and, and it doesn't matter if you love them. It doesn't matter if you agree with them. It doesn't make one hoot of a difference. Your will is not broken. And the reason your will is not broken is because you're trying to force God to accept your traditions, your opinions, your theology, your interpretation of the word. <clears throat> Many Christians have never gotten to the place where they say, okay, God, I'm finished. I remember when I did this. In fact, that's the very verse of Scripture I used. I said, Lord, I'm falling upon that rock. Never again will I argue about my traditions or anything else. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. I'm finished. I'm broken. I'm done. That's when I got in a lot of trouble because... People got to fighting with you then. That's all right, because tell you what, folks, your will and God's will must coincide in order for it to be a blessing. God wants you to get the truth. Well, we got the truth over here in this. In the, in the, well, now, wait a little, are, why are you so miserable? If, you, if you're in the will of God where you're going to church, then why are you miserable? It may be you're in the right place. It may be you're exactly where God wants you, but your, your mind is wandering somewhere else. Or you've got some traditions you're trying to hold on to. Or you've got something that you're trying to hold on to. Unless that will is broken, you're going to have problems the rest of your life. And nobody can break that will but you. And you're going to fall upon that rock and say, I'm finished. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. I need you, Lord, more than anything else. And I'll tell you, when that spirit is broken, you'll know it. The moment after that, God speaks to you, 
It's no argument. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the third one. The biblical personal ministry. All right? It is true. God may have called you to a ministry. It may be God wants to put you in a great position. It may be he wants you to really uh, be in an exalted position. That may be what his will is for your life. Not so you're exalted, but so you can operate because he has given you what you need to do it. All right, now, <clears throat> you get in and God's will is for you to reach that ministry. Your will, because God triggered it on you, your will is to meet that ministry. So you begin to, to function in that ministry and crash. You come up against the will of God. God's will will never budge. What's your problem? You got arrogancy. You're haughty about the situation. You, you have to go back and humble yourself. You have to go back down and learn to be submitted before you can get up here. It is my will for you to come, but you're not submitted to authority. You're not submitted to me. You're not submitted to the word. You have a problem. <clears throat> So now, instead of going back and falling upon the rock and saying, I'm finished, he may say, well, I'll tell you one thing. You can say what you want to. I know God called me to this work, and that's where we're going to go. Wait a little. You're going to be crashing against the Spirit of God all the time. <clears throat> that will has not been broken, even though it may be perfectly the same will God has to you. <clears throat> the Lord may say, I want you to pastor church. All right? God's will is that I pastor church. My will is that I pastor church. It sounds like it's good. But no, I'm not ready to pastor church because I'm too haughty. I'm too sloppy. I'm too careless. I'm too poor a manager. I'm not a good leader. And God says, you wait. You're not ready. You sit back and you whine. It's God's will that I'm a preacher. But here I sit doing nothing. That's what you call a castaway if you don't watch it. What do you do? You fall upon that rock and say, Lord, what do I do here? <clears throat> what is wrong? What am I supposed to do? You move up there and you begin to start preaching and bang, you run into a crash. You haven't gotten to the place where God could use you. It was God's will for you to be there, but he had to hold you back. <clears throat> so you, you gripe and you grump and you complain. So God says, all right, put him on the castaway pile. Just put him in the castaway. If he ever gets broken... I can use him, maybe. But at this point, he's a castaway. He's trying to force me to do things I'm not going to do. God's not going to change his will for you or anybody else. And you come along and say, well, God, <clears throat> I'll tell you what, let me get in your good will, and eventually I'll get in your acceptable will, and eventually I'll get in your uh, perfect will. You're going to have to show me the scripture. That stuff makes sense. You can't prove that with Scripture. You might can say, the Lord told me so. The Lord has told a lot of people things. The Lord told some people to leave their wives and go marry somebody else too. I don't go with what the Lord said. Even if he shines, if he comes to me in radiant, radiant clothing, I'm not going to listen to that kind of thing. <clears throat> because it's not scriptural first. That's the reason. God doesn't have three wills. Take your choice. God's requiring all people everywhere to come into his good and accept the one perfect will and don't you try to get out of it any other way. When did we ever get an idea except this modern day religion that we can uh, just kind of tell God what we're going to do? See, this is where our wills are not broken and we're running. We got psychiatrists helping us. We got everybody helping us. You can go to counseling and a pastor will say, well, yeah, I think you need to get into the ministry. Yeah, you go on. And all kind of things. You haven't been to the rock. 
When you get to that rock and you're broken, it's altogether a different story. I'm not getting all my stuff together here, but I'm going to try to get over all of them if I can here. <clears throat> when Moses said, well, I'll tell you, God, you know, I do what you want me to do, but that is kind of hard, and after all, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, that good at this. He was going the other way. If you're going to wait till you're good enough, you're going to have a problem. I'm not talking about living in sin. I'm talking about getting into the will and plan of God. And, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, it's not Aaron the Levite thy brother. I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. <clears throat> I feel sorry for Moses. God had to come and crush that fellow. That rock had to fall upon Moses. If Moses would have fell on that rock, he wouldn't need iron. He wouldn't have iron to make a golden calf. Brother and sister, if your will is not broken, it can linger for many, many years, the suffering of that thing. You say, well, my will and God's will is the same. Maybe. The only difference is you're a long ways from each other. And now let's, let's go to the fourth place. Biblical strategies to overcome de demonic powers. <clears throat> All right, now, how many of you have ever heard somebody say, I heard this before and heard it a number of times, that if you dream that a snake, you know, dream about a snake, that uh, the devil will be on you for the next couple of weeks, probably. <clears throat> and they tell you what all you need to do. Because if you dream about a snake, you know, then the devil's after you. Where in the world do you read in the Bible where if you dream about a snake, the devil's after you? See, we plan those kind of things, and we begin to check on the devil, and we get our spiritual warfare books out, and we're going to hit that devil between the eyes. I'm telling you right now, and devil, I'm telling you right now, that the Bible says resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Well, that's not all it says. It has a big message just before that statement. James chapter 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. What is he saying? The devil's not going to submit to you. He's not going to, you can't resist him. If your will and God's will is not the same. Is it God's will that you resist the devil? Yes. Didn't God say he, he's going to give you power to resist the devil? Yes, amen. Well, then if it's God's will that I resist the devil and it's my will that I resist the devil, then what's wrong? Your will is not broken. What do you mean by that? You are, you are trying to use some spiritual warfare procedure to resist the devil instead of the biblical way. Your will is not broken. If Satan does not flee, Check out why. Go to the rock and say, I fall upon this rock. Lord, I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. I can't do it. That's what repentance is, really, falling upon the rock. That's what breaks you. <clears throat> now, you can't resist the devil. And the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And then they get to the place to the devil. And, and all this, and people walking around saying, Devil, I trample you under my feet. Devil, 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 devil. You know what? What they end up doing is they're defeated, they're sighed, they're brokenhearted. They can't understand why. <clears throat> because God's will is that before you can resist the devil, you have to submit to God. You have to get in his will. But I am in his good will. Well, you're going to have to get in his perfect will. Well, now, it takes 20 years to get in God's perfect will. Well, let's see about that. <clears throat> Paul is riding along. 
going down to Damascus. I mean, he's going to take over now. He is finished with Jesus Christ, and he's going to do away with God's people. And he's got papers of authority ready to go. But wait a little. <clears throat> Suddenly, he came face to face, crash, against the will of God. God's will would not budge. Who's going to budge? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. This man didn't know that Satan was using him completely. He was an instrument of Satan. And he didn't even know it until he hit that wall. That light shone upon him and he fell down blind. You know what his words was? Lord, what will thou hide me to do? He was totally, completely broken. But Paul, uh, you realize it takes 20 years to grow up. And, and Paul, it will take some time, particularly if you're in somebody's church, it's going to take you some time here. I mean, uh, you know, uh, let's not push it too fast here. Paul is fully growing right now. He changed gears. That man became so powerful that when Satan came around, I mean, he could turn around and say, I will come, come out of there, you, uh, out of that girl, you foul spirit, and bang, he's out. What did he do? He fell in line with God's will, and God's will, and Paul's will coincided, and everywhere he went, Bang! Things happened. Because his will was right in line with God's will. He didn't say, now, Lord, you know, uh, I'll, I'll start with your good will, you know, and then, um, you know, give me a year or two and... Straighten it up. All right. <clears throat> uh, so... Uh, don't want this machine going off. So you wave at me if that thing goes off. <clears throat> Paul didn't say, my Lord, give me a year to be in your good will. Two years, I'll be in your acceptable will. And three years, I'll be in your perfect will. He got in God's perfect will immediately because God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. He got all three of them in one shot. They're all the same. You know what, folks? It is God's will for you to resist the devil. It is God's will for you to resist the devil. It's God's will for you to have total victory every day of your life. But you'll never get it until your will is completely, totally, absolutely surrendered to God's will. I'm not talking about the religious way of doing it and say, I surrender. Lord, I surrender. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you are totally broken. <clears throat> In God's kingdom, when you're broken, you're usable. If you have a vase that's broken, it's probably not usable. Or a plate that's broken, but in God's kingdom, he's looking for broken pieces. Because he alone can restore and make, mold, and change. You have to make a decision. Not just sing a song, not just do religiously. Go to the altar and shed a few tears and say, Lord, here I am. <clears throat> do with me what you want to do. And tomorrow morning you get up and do what you've been doing. A broken will submits totally and completely. Here is the results of a broken will. The results of a broken will is absolute humility. Anything else won't work. <clears throat> humility gets rid of pride. It's a crucified life, and that's what makes the difference. See, <clears throat> Jesus said that Satan is a liar. 
And that's one of the tricks he'll try to use to lie to you. All right, now what will he do? All right, you better watch this. All right, now you and your wife are going along pretty good. Everything going along fine. And all of a sudden, she thinks you said something and you don't think you said it. And Satan tricked you into believing somebody said something he didn't say. It may be something like this. I think the people over, I saw Nancy and Maxine talking, and I think they were talking about me, I think. What makes you think so? Because they kind of looked at me. How did he look at you? Did you look at them? <clears throat> See, Satan will whisper all kind of things to you. It's a trick. And Jesus said he's a liar and the father of it. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of himself. So Satan has those characteristics. Number one, he's a liar. Number two, he's a deceiver. And take heed that you be not deceived, Jesus said. Luke 21, 8. He made sure you understood, don't be deceived. Paul mentioned don't be deceived. Satan's a deceiver. <clears throat> He'll try these things on you. But if you're broken, you'll find God's will for your life. God will begin to signal you, watch out, be careful. You're going the wrong way. In the third place is uh, the scripture speaks about Satan, or at least the spirit of Satan rising up in pride and saying, <clears throat> I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to do that. See, that kind of a situation, watch this. That kind of situation in the church. Nobody going to tell me what to do. I know what, what God called me to do. Wait a little. Mm-mm. And how many of you realize you might be used to Satan to destroy your brothers and sisters? If you're not broken, it'll happen. <clears throat> now let's go to number five. The uh, biblical personal occupation and financial success. Is it God's will that you succeed? He said in Ephesians chapter 4, 28, let him stole steal no more. But rather let him labor working with his hands to things that is good that he may have to give to him that need it. Not just enough money for you, but enough money for others. Is it God's will then that I succeed? <clears throat> sure. My God shall supply all your need. It is God's will to supply all your need. All of it. So it's your will to have your needs met and God's will for the needs to be met. Because God has placed in you a desire to be in his will to be debt free. <clears throat> so God's got his will here, but your will is you've never been broken. Because before those blessings can come, you have to check on your integrity. You have to check on your tongue. You may have to have your tongue broken. You may have to have your character broken. You may have to have your will broken. If not, here's what will happen. All right, God wants you to have a nice house, and he wants you to have a good automobile to travel in. I'm convinced of that. It's your will to have a house paid for, and a good car to drive. So you start out to make that end meet, and bang, you came against the will of God. You crashed. Wait a little. Isn't it God's will for me to do that? <clears throat> yes. But you're not honest. Your will has never been broken. You are not honest with your dealings. When you went to trade off that car, you lied to that fella. You didn't give him the full story. <clears throat> Furthermore, I can't give you the job you need because you're not cable clean enough. 
You have an unclean spirit operating in you. Your clothes is dirty. Your face is dirty. You don't have very good sanitation about yourself. I can't give you the job I want to give you. You're completely out of my will. Sure, it's my will, but you're not where you ought to be. You're going to have to straighten up. You're going to have to clean up. You're going to have to learn to keep your car clean. You're going to have to clean your house up. You're going to have to do things different. You say, well, now, wait a little. Now, that's pretty bad. No, God's trying to help you. God is a clean God. You ever know that? God's a clean God. And see, so he says, no, you, you haven't been broken yet. If you've broken, what you're trying to do is carry your philosophy, your theology, your, your ideas, your opinions, your upbringing, your poverty-stricken ideas. You're not doing what I want you to do. Your will is not broken. Well, what am I going to do? Fall upon that rock and say, Lord, I am making a decision today that I'm going to take a bath. I'm going to clean up. I'm going to wash. I'm going to comb up. I'm going to be clean. I'm going to clean the car up. I'm going to clean the house up. I'm going to clean everything up. And I'm going to keep it that way. Now let's go. No, you're not honest. I take care of integrity first. You're going to have to get your word straight now because you're not, you're not a man of your word. So the word's not going to work in you because you're not a man of the word. Folks, these things are hard. You, felt, you are the ones that ask for this. And you got those fellows that come along and they'll say, well, the devil did this and the devil did that and the devil this and... You know what, folks? I'm amazed at how many people are fooling around trying to decide what the devil's doing. Oh, don't you, don't you go up there where those Indians sacrificed, you know, up there on that mountain? Where they, they buried, I mean, you go to that grave site, Dave, and they tell me that for the next three weeks you got devils all over you. Where in the world we get that out of the Bible? When Gideon, I mean, when, uh, yeah, Gideon, <clears throat> when Gideon goes out that night and takes a saw and cuts down his daddy's grove trees and overthrowed the, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the altar that his daddy made to a foul god and goes out and kills his daddy's oxen and offers it to the Lord, you think he had goosebumps the next day? Do you think the devil was on his case for the next three days? It's, I tell you, folks, until we get the will of God in our life and break that crazy will off of us, of all that nonsense and theology, we're never going to be able to resist the devil, keep our jobs, our marriages, or anything else. <clears throat> Y'all ask me what's wrong, and I'm trying to tell you. Would you rather not know? <clears throat> sure, God wants you to be successful. He wants you to have it. Now, number six. <clears throat> All right, let's, let's look at this. <clears throat> All right, now, it's God's will that a, he said it's not good for a man to be alone. You see, it wouldn't be good for Eric to be alone. He can't run things, you know? <laughs> And I can't run things, so you see. All right, now God says it's not good for you to be alone. Is it God's will for you to marry? Very likely, yes. All right, now, let's do it this way. It is God's will for you to marry. It is your will to marry, right? All right. Nothing wrong so far. It's God's will for me to marry. It's my will to marry. All right. So I find me a, a person I want to marry. I want to marry that person. I want to marry him now. But the will of God is, no, you can't marry yet because you haven't learned to be a man yet. 
You're too childish. You got too big a temper. Because if I'm going to give you this jewel, I expect for you to treat her correctly. And you haven't learned that yet. But I want to marry her. She's not growing up yet either. But I want to marry. It's God's will that we marry. Yeah, and you get married, crash. You got a problem. Now you're in sorrow. A prophet told me that it was God's will for us to get married. God told us it was his will for us to get married. Yeah, but your will wasn't broken. Your will is corrupted. Your will is perverted. Because you're trying to force God to do something out of his time. Same thing in a ministry. You try to push God on a ministry before you're ready for it, you're going to have a crash. That's why, beloved, you need to fall on that rock and say, this is it. <clears throat> Once you've come into a crash with God's spirit and you realize you went out of God's plan and out of God's will, you better fall on that rock and find out where do you go now. All right, Lord, I'm in a financial bind. I married the wrong woman. My car is no good. My house is, uh, I don't have a home to live in. What do I do now? Fall upon that rock and stay there until you are completely, absolutely, and totally broken. Do I bring my wife along? <clears throat> if your wife, this has to be done on a personal basis. If you start saying, break my wife, break my wife, break my wife, you got a problem. You break yourself first. Get yourself totally in line with God's will. And then God can begin to show you how to get out of your mess. He show you what to do. It's not going to be as good as it was being in God's will. You're, you got a choice now, good, better, or best. And you decided to take the good. So it's going to be problems. It's like Adam and Eve. <clears throat> Can you imagine Eve looking at that tree? Satan says, you know that is the best taste of fruit. And what God's doing, he's robbing you a blessing. He, he don't want you to have the best. <clears throat> but if you just reach up there and take one of those, that fruit right there, your eyes will be open. And you don't have to be walking around like somebody running over you. You'll be a God. And you'll know, you'll know everything, knowledge and all. God's trying to keep you from that tree because he don't want you to have fun. You go on and take of that tree, everything will be all right. And God knows the day that you eat of that tree, you're not going to die. She reaches up. It takes that fruit. Oh, it smells so good. She bites into it. She swallows. And suddenly, guilt, condemnation, shame, reproach, separation from God has taken place. But God didn't leave him in that terrible condition. That's why he sent Jesus. That's why he can take your messes, your failures, your messed up mind, and everything and change your marriage and all. But don't you dare forget that it's not going to be as good as it would have been. Because you have goofed. <clears throat> Let me get the numbers up. Biblical healing. With long life will I satisfy him and give him my salvation. Folks, I don't have time to speak on this much tonight. <clears throat> but you say, is God's will for me to be healed? Yes. Is God's will for you to be healed? But crash! Every time I talk about it, yeah, you've been eating too many Reese cups. 
say you've been doing things that tell you not to do, break your will. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's going to be healed by that. I'm not saying that. I don't know why some people die. And furthermore, it doesn't make any difference. I'm just saying to you tonight, do the same thing with the will of God on your healing. Make sure that you don't run into a crash against God's will. It may be God's will for you to be healed, but you're not doing what he tells you to do. He said, with long life, will I satisfy him? And I go out here and eat ice cream and fatty stuff all day long and just keep on and keep on and then wonder what I got a problem for. It may be back, go back to the rock. far better than this I'm homesick for heaven where loved ones have gone who are safe in his wonderful care if we could but hear from our loved ones so dear they all say they